Thank you, Paul. Good morning. Um, getting the post-surgical pain control talk is akin to being the last kid picked for dodgeball. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I'd like to thank Mike Torchia, my fellow, for actually uh, helping me put this talk together. So we know there's an incredible amount of patient factors that really relate to how a patient feels in terms of pain control after a shoulder replacement surgery. This has actually been studied um, uh, extensively. This one uh, study in 2018 uh, showed that 75% of patients with shoulder arthritis had actually had a, a narcotic prescription within a year prior to their surgery. And if you look at all the factors that had some relationship to post-operative pain and need for narcotics, previous prescriptions was probably the strongest predictor. So patient education is extremely important. The more you can get patients off of narcotics preoperatively, the easier they are gonna be able to transition afterwards. Patient education has been shown to probably be the most powerful um, uh, predictor of uh, managing these uh, patients postoperatively. This study won the NEAR Award from Rothman. Uh, Luke Austin's uh, paper showed significantly less opioid use and a 2.2 times more likely uh, chance of discontinuing opioids within three months with the simple uh, education module about dependence and addiction, uh, addiction risks. Uh, Vani Savison has studied this as well, showing significant reduction in opioid use at 48 hours. Regional blocks um, are, that's probably the our, our go-to at WashU in terms of pain control. Uh, what is the level one evidence? Uh, interscalene blocks have been shown to be better than suprascapular nerve blocks in terms of um, pain relief and satisfaction. Single shot blocks are not quite as effective as continuous in terms of pain control at 24 hours and beyond. You can make a block stronger by adding dexamethasone and clonidine. What about opioid-free arthroplasty? Is it possible? The answer is yes, and this has been studied uh, uh, by Vanny Savison, and it's also uh, been studied by Natty Hamid. Uh, and uh, these, these pathways require a fair amount of, pre -op of planning, basically. So you load patients with gabapentin, uh, non-steroidals, um, Tylenol, performing interscaling block. These surgeons actually use intraoperative uh, liposomal bubicane, and then we're able to manage the patients postoperatively um, uh, without um, opioids in all but one patient. Only one patient needed uh, rescue medications. My preferred treatment is an interscalene uh, block. It's, this is a catheter. Uh, we, I think it helps prevent rebound pain. We use postoperative acetaminophen and uh, narcotics with selective use of Cotorolac. We're going to move forward with a uh, Celebrex uh, protocol pre and post as well. Um, we studied this pathway and actually showed that uh, the average amount of uh, narcotic usage after a shoulder replacement was uh, 20 to 25 tablets, and we were prescribing 60 uh, post-surgery, so we figured out they were given too much medicine. So in conclusion, uh, preoperative opioid use is the strongest predictor of postoperative narc use. Interscaling blocks are the gold standard, and if you're going to use a single-shot uh, block, figure out a ways to uh, potentially extend that. Uh, consider adjuvants uh, to your blocks. And uh, if you want to uh, develop a pathway for opioid-free arthroplasty, it's certainly doable. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. You know, you were selected because you're thoughtful. And to be introspective and to admit that you went from 60 to 20 pills, that, that's a real admission. Um, we're going to go to the panel now and have you judge. Interestingly, uh, Wassim just told me that, that as Mike's former fellow, you'd never even seen a patient post-op. So we're, we'll be very <laughs> curious about your, uh, your comments. But Paul, comments first. Yeah, it's great talk. So I would I'd give it a nine. And then just a question. So we've had uh, great success with the indwelling catheter blocks. But we do have a little bit of a challenge sometimes with the different sites and having the follow-ups. We have to have our anesthesia group with them call them. At different sites, have you found any resistance or have you had some workarounds? If you happen to go to, say, an ASC, but they don't have an anesthesia group who will follow them or continue to call them? Yeah, that's important. If you're going to do an interscaling catheter especially, you have to have a, a team follow them. And we've been, in the three hospitals where I operate, um, the anesthesia team is very involved. But there's a lot of phone calls. How do I manage the catheter? This thing's leaking. I don't feel comfortable taking it out. My pain's really bad. It doesn't work without that, without them following up. And fortunately for us, they've been able, they've been willing to do that. Paul, what was his grade? 
Oh, nine. Thank you. So, nice talk, Jay. Uh, you didn't touch on liposomal bupivacaine at all, though. So, what's what are your thoughts on that? What does the literature show? How does that compare to interscaling blocks and catheters? Is one better than the other? So, if you if you uh, use liposomal bupivacaine, um, it is as effective as an interscaling catheter at those later time points. The problem with that, if you use it by itself is the immediate pain relief, like in the recovery room, is not as good. So you have to, you have to supplement that with a, a quick-acting um, anesthetic as well. So I personally don't have any experience with that. Our hospital system still hasn't approved it because of the cost. Air Hospital just approved it, but they keep it off-site. So I can ask for it, but I have to figure it out ahead of time when I'm going to need it. Yeah. Mike, you his grade? Uh, 8 out of 10, since he didn't mention bupivacaine. Otherwise, great talk. Jerry will give me a higher score. Nothing else to add. I'll, I'll go with a 9 too. Nice. Hey, Jay, uh, <clears throat> a couple questions. Who does your patient education, and what do you do with the people that are, are on a lot of narcotics pre-op? How, how do you deal with that patient? So my nurse, we have developed a lot of educational tools that are online and brochures just about the whole process of, of having a shoulder replacement. <clears throat> if I have a patient that has preoperative narc, uh, use. I don't have an education pathway for them. I do talk to them about decreasing. Some of them are seen by pain clinic, and I'll, you know, my nurse will reach out to them and we'll try to taper them down a little bit. But I, I don't work on trying to get them off narcotics completely. Maybe I should. Um, that Tiboni, what T? What grade did you give him? I gave him a nine for the presentation, nine for the content. Thank you. Uh, Wassim, you get to grade Dr. Keener. Be careful, he is a mean cat. <laughs> and I'll be in St. Louis with him, so. So your grade is? 9.5. All right. <laughs> I'd have given him a 10 for that. 